All right. Welcome to the podcast, Daniel, for a second Listen, time. Nelson, it's so great to be here again. Thank you so much. I enjoyed last time so much. Thank you for this. Oh, me too. I'm so excited for this conversation. So much, so much different content we can dive into today. Excellent. So, excellent. Excellent. So in preparing for this, I had the chance to read some of your work. There's many fascinating pieces that you put out. You're a prolific writer, prolific, <laughs> prolific conversationalist. Yes, thank you. You're very kind. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Nelson. Yeah, yeah. So one, one of the pieces that was so fascinating was you titled it Meaning Crisis as the Sign of Hope, as a sign mm. of hope. And I'll, I guess I'll just go into, into uh, a couple aspects of it, uh, a couple of the notes that I took on it to just refresh us, and then we can just Wonderful. go from there. Excellent. So, so you described how I understand what, what you were talking about in this, in this lecture was um, right now we view the meaning crisis as like this negative thing, right? We view right. it as like, it's a bad, we're in a crisis of meaning and we don't know what to do with ourselves. And there's more right. nihilism. There's, there's all of these things, rampant depression, isolation, loneliness, but you actually reframed it. It's actually a good thing. It's, it's hopeful. Like it's, it's an opportunity to explore other ways of finding meaning and I, I found it so fascinating that you pointed to to the obvious fact that we're this isn't a new thing by any right. means you know like it w w when I was exploring a lot of the content in the meaning in the space of like this meaning crisis and John Bravakey's work and all this stuff I got yeah I did get this sense of like oh this is like a new thing like we've never had this big of a crisis of meaning we've never gone this deep into nihilism because you know we've had other ways of finding meaning through religion or whatever right and he basically said yeah exactly we we had ways of finding meaning before through religion through totalitarianism you said communism fundamentalism war <laughs> violence racism you know <laughs> many ways of finding meaning right and and basically what i got from the lecture is we've just upped our standards now we're like yep. all right we're not going to settle for you know violence as a way of finding meaning war as meaning communism totalitarianism authoritarianism there oh, as a way of finding meaning and so you you wrote that right now we see the meaning crisis as being depressed and sad as, a, as opposed to seeing it as heroic. And so you were reframing it as seeing it as noble and heroic. The fact that we're in a meaning crisis because we've upped our standards. Right. So I'm curious if you could speak a little no, bit. No, that, that, that was outstanding. And again, I, I'm, I, it means a lot that you would spend so much time looking through all this work and doing all that it really means a lot. So thank you very much. Um, well, you know, so the meaning crisis, as Verveke and a lot of people have discussed, um, you know, it, it's very important to note that it is based, it's not merely an idea, it is based on the kind of objective fact that mental illness is rampant, that you have people having drug overdoses, um, mental illness. Illness. You can see some of the uh, some of the records of uh, hospital admissions. I mean, the meaning crisis in the sense when you're talking about the mental health crisis and things like that, it, it, it is based on things that are actually occurring. Um, that and now what's very interesting is when you go as the wonderful Dr. Cadell last points out in his in his lectures on Freud is that you know there was this idea when they talked about psychoanalysis and mental health there was an understanding for, for like that the thinking of Freud in them would be needed the more a nation trans transitioned to a first world nation as in like mm -hmm. psychoanalytical existential problems were not things you really needed to worry about when you spent most of your time figuring out how to get clean water or food but as a nation industrialized and improved and therefore you know had more time the problem of leisure as uh, the great Johannes on Heidegger will talk about and how do what do we do with our leisure our free time in a productive way um, you know as that problem emerges which is inherently existential uh, then all of the problems of the mental the mental health figuring out what to do with it um, come into existence now as someone like an Eric Fromm will talk about the moment we get increased freedom as human beings because we um, we tend to run from it because although we talk a lot about liking freedom the problem with freedom is you're also responsible and also you have have to ask a lot of questions and become very intellectual and philosophical and that's very very difficult and under those conditions it can be very tempting to then run to totalitarianism to run to racism to run to xenophobia or these things because that will give you um that will give you meaning that will give you an answer that will give you direction in life because also when you talk about the meaning crisis we could also think about it also as a kind of direction crisis people don't know what direction to take their life because they don't know what direction there is meaning. So meaning and direction go together. Um, and you know, if you're if you're uh, you know if you're of the right race race and you're supreme, that gives you direction because you know how to organize yourself with minorities. If you're part of the Third Reich, that gives you direction. But the main point 
is we have to realize that meaning has been a problem for every single civilization, just like food, just like shelter, and, and so on and so forth. It's that for most of human civilization, though, their moral standards were such where possible solutions to the lack of meaning or the need for meaning um, would not uh, bracket out, say, racism, violence, xenophobia. Those were acceptable right. solutions yeah. <laughs> to the problem of meaning. What's happened today is we don't accept those answers anymore. And so the meaning crisis is in a way self-imposed. It is an intentional, to use a Hegelian term, negative, like negative space where we've said, no, we're not going to use xenophobia anymore. No, we're not going to use racism. We're, we're not going to use fundamentalist religion. We're going to find a new source of meaning. The metaphor that you can get in mind when people discuss the meaning crisis is that it's kind of like a dark alley. You know, we were kind of stumbling around and we stumbled into a dark alley and we look around or maybe it's a dark room and we're like, oh crap, where are we? And we turn the doors locked and we're like, how the crap did we get here? You know, what's going on? Yeah. Like, it's like something we stumbled into and now we don't know what to do. I think it's really important instead, though, to view it. Um, the, the paper talks about um, Thomas More or, um, you know, Bonhoeffer. You know, Thomas More, it famously, it, he, it's uh, in The Man of All Seasons, a wonderful movie. It, I think it won the Oscar in like the 40s, 60s. I'm not sure. But it's a play. It's originally a play by Mr. Bolt, I think. Um, Robert Bolt? Forgive me. Uh, but it's about Thomas More um, refused to give the king a, a nomen. He wouldn't give him a divorce because it went against his principles. So right. Thomas More is put in jail and he's eventually beheaded. Right. Thomas More at any moment, at any second, could have gotten out of prison simply by giving the king, king what he wanted. Mm -hmm. The ultimate execution that he suffered was a result of um, standing for his principles, for standing up for his values. But he could have left at any point. He knew how to get out of prison. He knew how to get out of prison. It's simply that that answer was one that he would not accept because it, did not, it no longer met his values. Um, in the same way, we do, in fact, know how to end the meaning crisis. We just go back to nationalism. We just go back to closed mindedness. We just go back to uh, getting rid of pluralism. And in fact, there are lots of people today, unfortunately, who are doing that, who are turning into conspiracies because conspiracies can give your life meaning, who are turning to fascism because life fascism will give your life meaning, totalitarianism or simplistic binary thinking of good versus evil, as you can see both on conservative and liberal sides. All of those will give your life direction and all of those will give your life meaning. The issue is that there is increasingly, there has also been a kind of moral evolution, if you will, that is partly why you have the meaning crisis because that moral evolution says, no, we can't do this. We've got to do something better. Now, part of the problem is we don't necessarily know a new solution at this point. We're in a kind of suspended place where we're trying to have a conversation to find out what the answer would be. And you see Mr. Viveki doing the work on these um, new practices. He just had a conversation with Johannes and the wonderful Dan Daniel Zaruba on new, you know, like down, like very practical um, practices. Wow, practical practices, Dan. You can be more articulate than that. Uh, you know, like these ritual, these different things to find meaning, the aesthetic, the arts, and different things, because that's what you're getting into. But it's just very important to, to close, and then I'll pass it back to you. If metaphors matter, and if you think of the meaning crisis as a dark room we're locked in and we don't know what to do, then it's depressing and nihilistic, and that's only going to make the mental health get worse. Um, the hospital, all of the drug overdoses are only going to get worse. But if we can reframe it as a situation that is more akin to Thomas More refusing to give the divorce, and therefore there's something heroic about it, then that can give us the motivation and, and a sense of beauty in it, and a sense of um, character in it, and a sense of en endurance in it that will help us sustain the effort that we are currently in to see it through to where we can discover a new source of meaning that does not fall back on old solutions to meaning of which no longer match our moral, our moral standards. So I think by reframing the meaning crisis in terms of being a heroic act that is opening a possibility space for something new and something better that meets up to our new standards mm -hmm. will help us endure. Uh, you know, like Dilsey, I just had a great conversation with Raven and, and Padel and Davout on, uh, on the fan, Javier Family Symposium where we talked about the sound and the fury. And in, in the sound of the fury, Faulkner talked about Dilsey, the, the servant of the Compton family. It's all fallen apart the whole family everything's a mess uh it's just the you know they lost the civil war and it's unveiled that their moral system was evil and they can't go back to it i actually think faulkner for this conversation is quite 
pertinent, is quite quite important. Um, a lot of the Southern writers are, as are the mm. Russians, because they similarly have had unveiled to them the immorality of their previous systems, and they're trying to find direction, and they don't know what to do. Uh, and uh, But you have Dilsey is standing in the space um, of enduring. Faulkner said, see, endured. And there's something heroic and beautiful about that, and we need to see ourselves as, um, as we're on this um, in this process to to align ourselves with that enduring and to see character beauty and meaning in that in that um in that act right yeah that, and that was the sense that i was getting as you were speaking was you know is the process of searching for meaning meaningful in and of itself right like mm. like knowing that that to stay in integrity to stay in character in in this moral integrity we're not going to give into that but yet also knowing that that there is no nothing we can grasp onto, you know, like, where is that, you know, uh, how do we kind of work our, our way out of nihilism in, in this situation, right? How do we not, like, for, for me, it's been like, how do I just not fall into nihilism is kind of the key question is like, all right, I don't have any way of finding meaning, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the world is meaningless or, or like, right. like not falling into meaningless, even though there's nothing in nothing tangible and meaningful, you know, as a way to, to, to move towards, you know, it's very uncertain and ambiguous and all these things. And so what was coming up a lot was the critical thinking article that you wrote. So you wrote mm. this article on being critical of everything. And, and it felt like there was a lot of relations here in, in terms of, you know, right now it feels like we're in a point where we're just critical of every single past way of making yeah. meaning, but, but, you know, it, it, it seems a bit more rare that people are actually coming up and constructing and building new ways of finding meaning, you know, Verveke being one of one of the few that's really doing some amazing work on trying to develop new ways of making meaning, you know, yeah. and so I'm curious if I, I'm sure there's there's a lot of relations in your mind as well. I'm curious if you could uh, riff a little bit on no uh, excellent, criti excellent. Being critical versus building and like the critical thinking aspect. That that's magnificent. Um, and I and I will add, I do think one of the if you accept just based on what you said, um, if you accept the idea that the meaning crisis is a result of an intentional is intentional uh, for the sake of a higher standard, there is actually something meaningful in that very act. So that of itself right. can give one meaning as a solution to, to the meaning crisis as we stay in this space of, well, and we'll, we'll talk about, um, as we talked about last time on um, aesthetic epistemology, creativity, beauty, and all these different things, I do think that that is a critical direction to go in on the, on the conversation and the Berjaev and the meaning of the creative act and uh, his work and some of the Russians. And, and then um, again, I'm just throwing out names. I, I hate to do that uh, because I could be tempted to speak about all them forever or um, like uh, Fondaine that I'm reading with Davout and John David, who I adore on the, the, the non-rational being necessary mm. to escape delusion capture and, and so on and so forth. Right. But on what you're saying on the critical thinking, um, if I, uh, you know, if I was um, king of the world, which a uh, good thing I'm not because everyone would be drinking coffee all the time. Uh, you know, I think the phrase critical thinking was a terrible mistake. Uh, critical thinking. Instead, we may have wanted to go with, uh, you know, dialectical thinking to stress Dr. Last or to think about um, deep thinking. But instead, we have this phrase called critical thinking, which, of course, sounds like being critical, right, or being a critic, which then following that language, because unfortunately, Words have a tendency to capture our thinking without us realizing they're doing it. You know, words are so words are sticky. So if we use a phrase, so if in our head we associate the critical thinker with the good thinker, it doesn't take long for that to get stuck subconsciously with being a critic. And once we get to being a critic, it's not, it doesn't take long for being a critic to become being critical. So you get a society that thinks they're being critical thinkers by simply being critical of something. No, don't get me wrong. Uh, there's something to be said that if there is in fact standards of good art or bad ideas, there are in fact a place for pointing out that that is not good or so on and so forth. But, but it's quite dangerous to assume that simply because someone is being critical, they are therefore being a good thinker. Um, because otherwise that's going to incentivize a culture of everyone to be incredibly deep um, deconstructive. Now, if we go to Derrida, Derrida made quite clear the word deconstruction is from a term in Heidegger, I can't recall, that's supposed to be making a clearing for reconstruction. Um, I think we have to understand Derrida's now, I, you know, once you get into like some of the other thinkers, Pierre uh, Damon or some of the others, deconstruction may not quite be this, but to Derrida's defense, 
um, deconstruction was supposed to be tied to a reconstructor, making a clearing uh, for something new. So similarly, if critical thinking was attached to an understanding of clearing a way to make space for a new construction, that would be one thing. Uh, but the subconscious mind, the brain, the brain is the frenemy. I think we talked about this, like your brain doesn't your brain doesn't want to spend energy on building something. Your brain wants to like tear down. And it also wants to tear down because the act of like attacking something positions you as being superior to it without you making any risk. If you build something, you're at risk. But if I tear something down, there's a few things. Um, I think Rand once said it was a quote where she said it takes um um five, it takes like years to make the statue, you know, like the Michelangelo, one of the, the statue of David or something like that. It takes five minutes for any brute to destroy it. Uh, you know, it takes years to create something and minutes to destroy it. So one, there's an incentive of ease to destroy. Um, two, there's an incentive of you're not taking risk because you make something and then it's out there in the world for to, to judge. So there's a risk factor. The brain doesn't like risk. Three, if you have a culture that views the, the, the critic as being superior to the work and allows that, then we get into a game theory situation, which we can do, we can discuss, of which then there is incentive in order to be a critic that never makes anything because you get all the social status and so on and so forth. Um, and so then there's incentive to do that. And then four, if there is kind of a, a hopelessness in the culture about even the possibility of making anything meaningful, and in fact, you can get um, you can get a lot of praise by just accepting that and being kind of nihilistic and destructive, well, then you're going to do that as well. Um, so there's a lot of social incentives to become deconstructive in a non-reconstructive way. Right. Um, there's a language of critical thinking that positions people to be critics and to receive and to view themselves um, as being deep thinkers because they're critical. Oh, because it's really important. When we, you know, so everyone, you know, there's always the social game of positioning your set, the social status, um, Alan de Bada, you know, he talks about the social status. There's always the hierarchy, Louis de Mon, different things. We also have to remember that we think and approach the world in a manner that also convinces ourselves that we're a deep thinker. Like we're all, mm -hmm. not only are we trying to wear a mask to others, we're simultaneously engaged in an act of wearing a mask to ourselves. Right. And this is why language like critical thinking is so dangerous because once you have a term like that, that is easily associated with being a critic, that gets into your subconscious mind and you yourself convince yourself that you are being a deep thinker by just being a critic. You're not, it's not bad faith in a kind of Sardian sense. No, 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 it's full blown. You come to believe that the, that the critic is a deep thinker. Now, if we take what I said about Derrida, there is the critic phase that's important, but, but the critic phase is always in service of the improvement or to make something better, not to tear down and um, to leave it clear because then you end up with nothingness. Um, the other thing I would say, what gets us in trouble is we associate critical thinking as just kind of like, uh, well, one, a, a problem is that everyone's, you know, no one thinks they're not a critical thinker. That's also a problem. You know, the, it's the other guys that aren't critical thinkers, right? <laughs> um, we also need to start thinking about critical thinking and, and this rephrasing, reframing might help, but like from the paper on critical thinking. Um, we tend to think of critical thinking as simply thinking well, like you're a really good thinker. I think it can help this problem that we're describing, which mm. feeds into the meaning crisis exactly what you're saying, because it becomes a tear everything down without replacing with anything. Um, it becomes a revolutionary spirit that doesn't finish the circle into something new. <laughs> it, uh, it, um, I think a, a framing can be, if we think of critical thinking as a different act of thinking entirely. And I think we need to associate it, um, you know how we, like a movie critic. Okay, so what does a movie critic do? They kind of watch a movie differently than other people do. They're paying attention to how the story is structured, how the actors perform, how it all comes together. They're structuring the way that the movie presents itself right? It's kind of a fuller thing. Critical thinking is the act where you are a critic of the way that your brain structures your reality to you. It is an act of being meta on the way that your thought constructs the world to you. Not, not cri being critical of things outside of you. It's directed primarily at the way that your own brain presents the world to you. So then you get into mental models, then you get into confirmation biases, then you get into all of the different rational, you know, the rationalist tradition, different things. But notice that in that situation, the critical thinking is primarily directed on you, not on others, but on you and how your brain, you become, you become a thought critic of your own thinking, uh, which completely transform it because then you're directing the, 
Because then the act of tearing down, I mean, you're not going to destroy yourself, right? You're, you know, because you have to fuck it. So what you're doing is you're tearing down the mechanisms of self-deception, not the mechanisms of your entire brain. So right. then critical thinking becomes in service of actually improving your thinking as opposed to being on um, the gradient that just the same kind of thinking that contributes to self-deception. Uh, the other thing I will say is, therefore, critical thinking as such Rather than being um, critical, where the other becomes someone you're critical of and then posture yourself as um, wise because you are so critical, which is problematic. Instead, critical thinking becomes incredibly tied to empathy because, because empathy is not merely the act of sympathy where you emotionally sympathize. It's the act of doing everything in your power to try to enter into the entire other worldview of another person to then look back on your worldview through their worldview. Right, right. It's not merely where you put your shoes in another person's shoes. You know, you view their worldview through the through your worldview. It's where you put your feet in another person's shoes, mm -hmm. where you enter entirely into their framework, into their way of thinking and so on and so forth, and then look back on yourself and try to think of the world through them. All of those understandings of critical thinking would be in service of empathy, of fighting self-deception, of only critique, of only deconstructing when it's in service of reconstructing. And all three of those are greatly in service. Well, they're absolutely what we need if we're going to find a new solution to the meaning crisis, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just stay in a space that you know contributes to endless hopelessness and things just get worse and worse. So I think reframing what we mean by critical thinking and deeply tying it to empathy and thus positioning empathy as a str arguably the most difficult thing to think is people. People are like the most complicated part, like understanding people and how people think about the world is arguably the most difficult of, of intelligent acts. That's why you'll have a lot of people with high IQs and PhDs have like not good family lives or not good friendship because that's a, because that's like, the thing is about like people understanding is it's not merely IQ. You also got to like, if we use all the, I guess, uh, Harry Gardner, where he talks about the different IQ, you know, the EQ, the kinetic, if we, you know, all the different intelligences, mm -hmm. body, like everything we described last time, aesthetic, you have to use all of those in concert with one another dialectically. Right. Um, that's how you can start like dealing with the, with the issue of other beings, other human beings and solving those significant problems that must be mm -hmm. solved for the social order to operate and for the meaning crisis not to become a massive problem. But to close, and then I'll pass it back to you, we're not even gonna think we need to do that if our understanding of critical thinking is merely being critical. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I also wanna add quite quickly, that if you ask people directly, do you think critical thinking is being critical? They would go, of course not. The question is what people do in practice. You know, it's a mechanism of self-deception to think that you don't associate uh, being critical with being intelligent. Uh, you have, you're, you, everyone knows the answer when asked directly. The pr people believe what they practice, not what they say. Words are mostly red herrings. Uh, as an actor said that once, like we mostly say what we, we mostly try to use words to get people not to know what we think, <laughs> to contribute to, to, you know, to con contribute to concealment, not to unconceal. Right. So it's the practice that people engage with. And if you pay attention to the practice, kind of like a Flannery O'Connor, don't be afraid to stare. What you see is a society that associates the person being a critic with the part like critical with the person being superior uh and and then you have social incentives um uh that are aligned with that so so anyway to pass it back to you um i do think our understanding of what constitutes critical thinking is in fact quite a contributor to um not rising to the occasion of the meaning crisis <laughs> amazing amazing it, yeah that was so amazing that was that was what was going through my mind as you were speaking was the empathy thing that we spoke on last time then you yes. literally just brought up that exact point <laughs> so uh yeah let me let me sit with this there's there's a lot moving around in the brain here you take your time i'm gonna sip on this coffee because i'm All addicted right. good <laughs> uh yeah so the the game theory thing was very salient as you were speaking you know like mm -hmm. critical thinking being an act of if, if you're just being critical all the time you're positioning yourself as above the other the other position in, in the social standing and what was coming up a lot and i'm gonna try there's gonna be a lot of moving parts here i'm gonna try i that like moving parts that makes it fun <laughs> <laughs> uh uh so we spoke a lot about in the last conversation how the rational isn't the true and like kind of this like circular rationality where where rationality justifies itself but never yes. never goes beyond anything and it just yes. maintains itself and so i was getting this sense a lot in terms of like 
let's say someone is being driven by social incentives to 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 interact in a game theoretic way in which they they're critical of other people they they're very defensive they're they're yep. not open to the other perspective and, and everything you talked about in, in your piece on game theory mm. conversations and so like that being the case in culture right it feels like on a, on a cultural level there's a lot of incentives to to be defensive to act yep. in these game theoretic ways in conversations because you know that's what most people are doing that's more common than than the opposite of em- empathy and openness yep. and all, all of these other things and so let's say so we live in this culture where, where that's kind of more common and so we have incentives to do that and and then let, let's say that we we you know at we're critical of things because that's that's what's easiest to do then we're just going to rationally justify to ourselves in a circular way that we're being critical that we're smart that we're intelligent just because of this this higher order thing or this this other social incentive that we're not even aware of is causing us to to act in the in these ways right and so perfect yeah so it's coming to me is how there, there was something with the meaning crisis and empathy and, and aesthetic epistemology that I wanted to bring into this as well in terms of, it, it feels like aesthetic epistemology in, or, or really empathy, I think is, is sure. where I'm centering around more. It's like really, you know, being able to, actually, I'm going to bring in some more parts here. Go right ahead. So, so the reading and the writing thing we were talking about earlier. Yes. Uh, reading and writing are, or, 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 or rather uh, conversation and writing are two different ways of, you know, engaging in the intellectual process. Yes. And, you know, you, writing is important in that it helps us refine our thoughts. But if we only write and do nothing else, then we're not going to have any other right. perspective to reflect back our own right. uh, delusions. And, and I, I, I just find it so fascinating, the, the process of being critical of the way that my thoughts are structuring the world and being critical of the way trying to find the de- delusions in my thinking because like not because you know through writing we're never going to be able to reflect back on ourselves to the is if writing does not feel like a very good process to be critical of the way that our thoughts structure reality it feels like conversation is the way to do that but then also writing helps conversation in a way that it it makes it more effective to articulate you know what our current yep. worldview is so that then other people can more effectively pinpoint the the things that I'm missing right and so I, I'm fascinated in hearing how you kind of understand this connection Excellent. between aesthetic epistemology empathy as a way to like become less diluted and to to refine our being critical of our own worldviews and and kind of I, I guess the sense I have is the game theory of conversation as Excellent. kind of this, 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 I don't want to say higher order phenomena, but this, this other, this social, this social yes. phenomena that yes. is causing us to be in this circular yes. loop of rationality. Yes. Excellent. Thinking. Magnificent. Uh, a few things. So first off, if you accept the premise that, you know, if your entire social order gives you kind of status by following the dominant strategy is the phrase in game theory, uh, which is to be critical Well, then, my gosh, you're going to be critical of this conversation that you and I are having right now, because that's just (laughs) suggesting that what you're doing is wrong. So so here's the problem. The the very logic and ethic of the critical thinker gives them a mechanism to discount any thought that would unveil that critical thinking as being a problem and therefore it can continue to be an internally consistent system. It could be a self-justifying system. That's why it's really bad. So you have this (laughs) self-justifying autonomous system that cannot stop other than for the people within it on their own to realize the errors of their way. But of course, why would they do that if they get social status and dominance and so on and so forth? That's why history unfortunately can show that that dynamic doesn't always change until there's like an economic catastrophe or something like that or war. And let's not get into that quite yet Uh, because the alternative is um, to allude to, and I'll get to it on, um, is how it seems like what changes people is either like they're forced to change because of a disaster or because of wonder which can get into kind of beauty so like being mm-hmm. they're like um they're um they're they're taken by something greater than themselves and that pulls them out of these internally consistent systems that be right. so let's put that on a hanger real quick mm-hmm. what's really important i think philosophy misses this or people miss this um 
there, there's actually two, and this is general, there are two things you have to address um, if you want to, if you want, you know, to change your own life, to, to kind of to pose a solution, okay? So there's one is tracing out the answer, okay? Whatever the answer may be, that's very general. There's actually a second, a lot of people think that's all you got to do. If I can prove to you the answer, well, then we're good to go. There's actually a second step that is very often missed out, which is why should you care? Why should you be motivated? This was Kierkegaard's extraordinary critique of Kant that was kind of pithy, but what he was saying was really profound. So, you know, Kant does all this work to link up the rational and the good. And he's like, it's rational to be good. And he does all this different work and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, Kierkegaard kind of yawns and he goes, okay, yeah, well, why be rational? And you see, it's kind of funny because what Kierkegaard is saying is, okay, Kant, that's fine. You have a, a system, you've made your point, but there's, but I don't care. There's no, what, how do you answer the problem of motivation? The problem of motivation. So you have the problem of the finding the answer, and then you have the issue of the motivation for the answer. Mm. So, you know, one of the reasons why to start, I think the reframing of the meaning crisis as a sign of hope is very important because if you see it as a sign of hope, that can re-motivate you to look to new answers. So if we, you know, if we continue to think that the meaning crisis is a hopeless nihilistic mess, and let's say we successfully argued that the game theory show that socially you have a dominant strategy and that's self-destructive. Well, if you think there's a meaning crisis and nihilism and whatever, why should you change? Why should you care? What are we going to escape that, that um, game problem, that nasty equilibrium? Uh, what are we going to escape it to? In fact, if life is meaningless, I love the dominant stuff because I'm now I, there's actually direction there because I know that I can just get the dominant strategy, dominate all my friends and have you know power. And that becomes a solution to the meaning crisis. Mm. So you know, one of the reasons I do think, uh, and that's arguably what's happened in a lot of neoliberalism, capitalism, and, and so on and so forth, is there's been like, yep, life is meaningless. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to be the dominant one at the dominant strategy. Right. So by reframing the meaning crisis um, into being a sign of hope, there then can be motivation once you recognize the nature of the social dynamics to be insular, to then try to break out of them. Whereas if you only show the social dynamic, I actually think this can happen in game, game theory thought. You know, you can successfully show the dynamics that cause the self-feeding problem, but by not creating any sense of motivation for people to care or to think there's hope to break out of it, they're not going to break out of it. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's how kind of, for me, they kind of go together because in, in the, the books we write, there's a whole book dedicated to the question of intrinsic motivation which I do think actually, generally speaking, philosophers don't talk a lot about motivation. And they actually, that, that's almost where the entire field of economics emerges. The problem of motivation almost entirely emerges out of the philosophical failure to have an answer to the problem of motivation. And that's also mm -hmm. something theology critiques philosophy about. It's like, okay, you've shown us the moral, but why should people care? Why should they care? And theology is like, well, because there's a higher dimension or spirituality or different things. You know, it really helps when you start thinking about spirituality, theology, economics, as um, you know, issues of motivation, because because then you start to see why they have a necessary role and where if you're going to do philosophy seriously, you have to take those fields seriously as well. Um, but you get into the game theory, you know. So you were talking about reading and writing. Um, you need both, right? Because the thing is, um, if you don't, in the same way that you don't want to be an introvert or an extrovert, you want to be an ambivert, right? Because the extrovert who never is alone with themselves becomes pathological, and the introvert who is always alone becomes pathological. You need both. Likewise, if you never write to get your own thoughts clear, then you don't have anything to bring to conversations. Uh, but but then if you never converse with people who are significantly different than you, then you never gain the ability to get outside of your bubble. You're probably going to fall into mm. tribalism. And the stuff you write is probably going to be mediocre. And you're not even going to have the eyes to see that it's mediocre. One of the things that happens if you like seriously try to publish books or different things, you give your writing out, you find out how good your brain is at interpreting what you create in a manner that makes it seem good. And you have to have this feedback lure because it's actually kind of a small scale meaning crisis. Like once you find out that that story you thought was really good is not good, do you become nihilistic or do you view gaining that information as an opportunity to therefore improve it? Because you could just have the answer of say, screw, in the, screw those people. This is the greatest short story ever written. This is the greatest paper ever written. They don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to use it. Well, that would be like going back to nationalism and so, you know, and totalitarianism in the meaning crisis. Right. That's the wrong answer, but it is an answer. And, you know, your mom will tell you it's good and you'll be able to live with yourself on how great your story is. Or the other bad response is to say, you're right. Everything I write sucks. You know, it's no good. Why do we even try? And then you give up. Well, that would be the bad nihilism right? Mm -hmm. What we want is the third answer, 
which is what, but the third answer requires the ability to take punches to the face. You know, it requires the ability to sit in that prison cell like Thomas More and not crack, you know, like the ability to take quote unquote punches to the face, you know, per se, to endure as Dilsey is, you know, to stand up. That's the only way that you can improve. Um, but there's two sides, because a lot of times people in conversation, they might be really good conversationalists to be able to play the game. Um, but they never want to go to write because, man, when you go to write and you have to like really put down what you say, you're like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. That's scary. So why don't you just stay over here in conversation where you get all the mm. social stuff? But then there's also the writing and you're like, I'm scared that people aren't going to like it. So you never give it to people or you never present those ideas. So you, so you stay on it. Both of those would be examples of staying in, as Cadell and I will talk about, AA thinking. You know, where it's just like one and you stay in the one as if the other is not there, when really you need to be dialectical, where you do both. So similarly, um, the only way you escape game theory dynamics, like is talked about in the game theory of conversation, is to serious is to um, one change your metric and one to change your relationship to the other. So whereas when we're talking about reading and writing, there's a temptation for the writer to demonize the speaker or the extrovert to demonize the introvert or vice versa. And you, and you change your metric, if you change your metric to understand that the only way to improve, to supplement, um, as, as, as Hegel um, mentioned, is to be AB, which is I other, you know, writing and reading this bothness. Mm -hmm. Well, then you don't even believe that you have success or that you've reached the goal until you incorporate the other. But you also have to incorporate the other in their fullness. That requires empathy. That requires really knowing them. And also that then creates a dialectic that um, it would be an entirely different subject that is aligning you with what Hegel calls absolute knowing, uh, which is always a perpetual process of reconstitution in light of that dialectical. And you're always improving, always improving, and always improving. Um, it would seem um, that you can't escape the Nash equilibrium of these social structures unless you change your metric. Like this is the slight, so you, you, know, you change your metric from AA to AB, that changes everything. But you also change your metric from conversations, like let's just use conversations as an example. You change your metric from being right to determining what is right. right, right. And of course, if you determine what is right, you'll also be right, but that's secondary. Because if your metric is to be right, well, the strategies are radically different. You just gotta shut down everyone because <laughs> then you're gonna be right. right. And if you have a democracy that believes the, the metric and goal is to be right, well, then the strategies that people use in conversation will reflect strategies mm. that are mm. dominant strategies. And that's going to give you a Nash equilibrium. What a Nash equilibrium is, is a situation where if everyone does what is rational, you end up with a suboptimal result. OK, a you know, a lot of people say the market is rational and that's true. But here's the thing. Just because the market is rational doesn't mean it's best. People can play rational and best. People mm -hmm. can do what's rational and precisely because they do what's rational, end up with a bad result. And the issue is that in a society that defines the goal as um, being right, well, then what's rational are strategies that maintain your beliefs. OK, and so you're going to cut out the other because what can the other do other than be a threat? Dang it. You're going to cut them out. Right. And of course, if you're writing, you're never going to have conversations under that because all the people can do is threaten what you've written. Right. right, right. But if instead your metric or, or vice versa, but if instead your metric is to determine what is right and to approve accordingly, suddenly the other becomes essential, not just a nicety. Mm -hmm. but a necessary, essential component of your intellectual and personal development. And empathy becomes primary if we understand it as the intellectual act that I was describing. You literally can't, you literally under this metric don't even engage in thinking unless you engage in empathy. It's like you never even begin true thinking. You may have thoughts, but you don't think. There's a difference between having thoughts and thinking per se right. following that. Um, but all that's going to take require taking seriously the other. So you change your metrics, you take seriously the other. So you can ergo, you go to AB or determining what's right. Those are the only ways you escape the social um, Nash equilibriums. And then it's by reframing the um, meaning crisis that there's even reason for you to care to do all this. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to have those parts that go together. Um, and, and if you don't, well, you got to have the whole thing. It's kind of like, we, I think we talked about, you know, and in, in you'll hear people talk about the um, truth, beauty, and goodness, right? Those three different things. I think we mentioned this last time. You have to have all three. If you're missing one, the other two don't work or they become corrupted. Like if you have beauty, but you don't have truth and goodness, well, I just use beauty, beauty to control people, right? There's no goodness or truth. But if I have goodness and it's not beautiful, who cares? Uh, if I have goodness and beauty, but I don't have truth, well, then it's a falsity and it's just ideology. So you have to have all three. Likewise, you have to have 
um, solutions, quote unquote, you know, direction, um, meaning, reframing, and motivation to care. And those things all kind of go together. And, and um, you know, the answer, like I said, the answer, uh, the, the, the schema of what's going to solve the problem, but also the motivation to care. You have to have all those things. And I'm afraid, and then I'll hand it back to you. Um, uh, I'm afraid very often philosophy um, does not think the problem of motivation. Uh, and that and that's been that's been consequential. Now it's a generality. I do think there are more philosophers now who are taking seriously psychoanalytical thinker. That's where that you know whether taking the person like a Zizek or Kader, you know that 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 changes things. But there has been a lot who have not for a long time. Right, right. I'm I'm, I'm still centering a lot around the 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 game. The, theoretics of conversation yep. and, and, and what I was centering a lot around was how do we view other that that felt very central is how do we view other is yes. and I, I think you cover that a little bit in terms of what's the what's the point of conversation right is the point of conversation to be right or or to refine our own truth that may not currently be present or or, or something like that yes and so in, in that it feels like how it, another way of reframing that in, in my experience feels like how do we view other do we view others yes. as a, a way to prove that we're right or or as an opportunity to be critical of our of our own delusions, right? Absolutely. And, and building on that, I, I'm I, I, I would I'm fascinated in exploring this dialectic between community and individuality. I think yes. we talked about this a little bit in the past. Introversion, extroversion, all, all of these like these dualities of you know self and community individual and all and 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 this is what it feels like i'm getting the sense that this is very central to a lot of the things we're talking about here in terms of like yes. the the conversation versus writing is kind of the same dialectic it feels like as individual community or introversion extroversion and all this stuff and in, in the sense of you can't just have one if you just have one then there, there's pathologies on on That's both right. sides if you just have one and, and and this really brings us to to one of one of your pieces i i didn't get a chance to to dive into all of it it was very long but belonging again yeah that's very long <laughs> if you had gone into all of it i've been like my gosh i'm just, I got, yes that's very long yes yes uh and so and so i mean i'll, I'll read a couple of things here i think it, it'll be help to freshen up on these uh you said we want to belong but we don't know we don't want to pay the price that comes with belonging yes. we don't want to pay the price of having our autonomy restricted while maintaining belonging the very conditions that create belonging, uh, that, that make belonging possible, make us feel restricted and like we aren't free. And yep. because of the emphasis on freedom, our identity feels created, but then it can often feel arbitrary. Um, yep. and, and you 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 talked about this um, character versus values, you know, like developing character is not the same as just creating values that could be arbitrary. And uh, this, this, the meaning crisis thing comes in again of like, yep. why am I following these values? Where did these values come from as in terms of, whereas the other side is like character and, and really, you know, building character in a community like that. It's a much different process. It feels like than just individual value creation in isolation or something like that. And so, yeah, so I, I got the sense of in belonging again, I got the sense of you're, you're trying to dialectically work with community and individuality, freedom and autonomy versus uh, more restriction, but yet also more community at the same time. That's right. And, and, and like there, there, and because there's in immense value on both sides. Right. And yeah, so as I'm speaking about that, I'm curious what comes up on this dialectic between community magnificent. and individuality. It feels very, very Mag magnificent. And, and it is very much tied to the reading versus writing. I think that was kind of Derrida's insight on grammatology, where he understood that the structures of communication had something on the formation of thought. And um, now I don't, I do, um, I hopefully in the uh, A Philosophy of Glances uh, with uh, Javier and, and Thomas, uh, we talk about how I think Derrida was incorrect to think that he deconstructs all metaphysics by deconstructing what I call the metaphysics of the gap versus the metaphysics of reading or apprehension. Uh, but that's another subject that I'll say that's hysteric and vague and everyone's like, what is he talking about? Uh, but you know, I think, but anyway, I appreciate there are part of that part of Derrida. Um, anyway, a few more things. Um, what you were noting on conversations, like on changing the uh, metric from being right to determining what is right, that you that also very much feeds into aesthetic epistemology.
technology, because all of that is a way to approach and think about a thing of which is transcendent of human subjects and could exist independent of them, but maybe ultimately in an incomplete manner, but in that incompleteness is not unknowable. So kind of the Flannery O'Connor mystery sort of thing, the thing that you know, you find out there's more to know when you go on and so forth. So, uh, so once you change the metric from being right to determining what is right, well, there has to be something that is right independent of human subjectivity, right? Um, something that in a sense exists objectively, but as we talked about last time, the categories of objective and subjective can be problematic because we instead need to talk about conditionality. So suddenly you have a, an epistemology of conditionality where, the, where conversations then become about how do we talk in such a manner that everyone involved in this conversation meets the conditions of grasping a higher truth which is greater than themselves. So then instead of trying to dominate one another, you are trying to create shared conditionality of which then is going to open them to where you, it becomes a, from a zero sum game where there are winners and losers, it becomes a non zero sum game where everyone can win together because they come to match those conditions together and therefore have a better grasp of a bigger truth of which improves everyone and that everyone benefits as opposed to a dominant strategy game where everyone does what is rational by the wrong metrics and ends up with a sub suboptimal result where only one person wins and now the friends don't talk to one another for the next six months because they're mad. So aesthetic epistemology becomes the, um, the next step that becomes necessary once you change uh, your metrics. So that, that's something to note. Um, also aesthetic epistemology uh, becomes necessary once you take seriously dialectical thinking. Because if you have like back and forth, right? Um, what's the difference between a dialectic and just like, you know, not being committed? right? Like what binds two opposites together? Uh, you know, what's the slash between the X and the Y, right? You know, like what's holding them together in a dialectical relationship? Well, there has to be an idea that we need to move back and forth to this because there is something loc there is something true that is not entirely located in either one of them that must be greater than either one of them. Mm -hmm. Just like there must be a truth that is greater than the opinions of the people in the conversation. Therefore we have to, but that requires an epistemology that is able to know something transcendent of, of the condition of the immediate situation to try to arrive at a conditionality to point to something more. So for a dialectic to work, there similarly has to be an epistemology of conditionality of which understands that the only way to get to the condition where you can be toward the thing that is greater than both of those things in their independence, but can only be known by moving between those things, you have to have a certain epistemology that understands you have to be conditioned to see that thing, right? That is beyond those two, those two variables and can be only known in the movement between those variables. Mm. So, so in order to really do dialectical thinking, you have to understand a, a epistemology of conditionality of which points to something that can only be known in the movement. But here's the funny thing. The moment you stop moving to see the movement, the movement is gone. It's like that famous Yates poem where he says, can you know the dancer from the dance, right? Is it the school children one? Where it's kind of at the end where he's like, um, you know, can you know the dancer from the dance? And kind of Yates is like, William Butler Yates is like, no, you, you can't. It's only in the dance that you know the dancer, right? You have to be doing it. Well, yeah. likewise, it's only in the movement of the dialectic that there can be pointing to the greater truth that we need as human beings to thrive. But the moment we stop moving to see it clearly, it's gone. So, so in order to even be toward what we are describing, you have to stay in the movement of that dialectical. But to, but to even understand everything I described, that will require tracing out aesthetic um, epistemology. Mm -mm -mm. In the same way, where do you locate the optimal result between reading and writing? Do you find it in the writing? Do you find it in the reading? No, but there is something between them that emerges because you move between them. But where is the between? Like, where is the between, right? It's kind of, no, you know where it is? It's in you. You create the between between them because you go from the writing and you go to, to the reading, right? So you're going, so it's in you, but here's the problem. Can you, can you see your own consciousness? Like, can you take your eyes out of your head, turn around and look at your own consciousness? No, you can't do it. You likewise cannot in a single moment think of the entirety of you right? Because you're kind of found in finite memories. You can only think of one part of you. Mm -hmm. And yet there is still a sum total of those memories in your brain. You just can't recall them all at once, right? The thing that is the bigger that has to be pointed to by the movement is, is very real. It's not too mystical. It's like the, the sum total of your neurons, dang it. You just can't know them all or link them together in the proper way 
all at once because you are stuck to a finite attention or finite focus. You can only do one. But in the movement between them, your subconscious mind moves, your conscious mind develops, all of you begins to move to formulate relative to that movement that you cannot locate because you can, in a sense, you can't look at yourself. <laughs> you can't pull your face off, turn around and look at yourself, right? Um, and that therefore creates the mystery um, that you can only ever know in part that is located in you. And yet here's the funny thing, cannot be reduced to you because you can never fully grasp it because you're always bound to a finite focus, right? Uh, right? We'll just multiply that on a network effect between everyone in a conversation, right? It's right. the same thing. And then you too, as Ethan Nelson or me as Daniel Garner, we are not reducible merely to our individuality because it is hooked up in a, a network of relations with family, friends, community, and so on. And so to locate us, it is an emergent result of all of those interactions, mm -hmm. as likewise our mind is an emergent result, the moving between the reading and the writing that can never be located and yet is just as tangible as my hand here, beca because you are a whole, just not a whole that can know yourself as a whole. It's always the tip of an iceberg, right? And so th therefore you always have to live with a lack because there is always that hole that is lacking, but lack is not nothing. It's a present absence, right? Mm -hmm. It's a it's an incompleteness, but with the I N in parentheses per se. Um, so the movement is the pointing. So you have to do that movement to get the pointing. If you do not do that movement, to speak on what you're saying, because um, as we were trying to locate this necessity of the movement between reading and writing for your individual. We now moved up to talk about the movement between it between a, a, a bunch of people talking. Belonging again is simply going to apply it on the entire socioeconomic order, uh, where you're going to need a similar movement between freedoms and givens. Is the you know you were talking about restrictions, so it's given like mathematical proofs. Some, there are things that are given that you don't even think about. Where if you think about too much, you get existentially overwhelmed. But if you're too free, you also get existentially overwhelmed. Uh, and so both of those become situations where totalitarianism becomes appealing. And totalitarianism, last time I looked, is not the goal. We are trying to avoid that. Um, so, you know, once you understand yourself um, as a result of emergent processes that cannot be isolated into singularity, not because they are not real, but because of the nature of how your brain works, then the other that becomes critical in your social development. The movement between reading and writing becomes critical in your individual development. And then the movement between like so smaller social groups, you know, this group of social friends, this group of social, the state of Virginia, California, like different, those then have to move between one another. And then you move to another scale. Well, America has to do with Europe and you can just take it all up and say, and every single one, one of those layers requires a certain dialectical relationship so that you can escape Nash equilibrium situations and not be tricked by rationality into a suboptimal result. And the only way that you're even going to do that is if you have some sort of appreciation of aesthetic epistemology, of which if you define critical thinking as being critical, you will always have a defense mechanism from keeping yourself of having to do. Right, right. And so mm -hmm. that's why people People define being critical as being a critical thinker. Amazing. So where uh, where does conditionality fit in this? I've I've been trying. I've been kind of making the link here between aesthetic epistemology and all of this, uh, but but I'm not really making the connection between like how does the conditionality of beauty link into to all of this I, I it's kind of there but not really you mean some guy talking for 20 minutes non-stop linking a bunch of things together is like how does it all go together <laughs> ah, that's weird I, why did that happen i don't know <laughs> no outstanding um oh. condition so aesthetic um conditionality experiences of beauty train you to understand that in order to get say the beauty of tolstoy you have to meet the condition of learning how to read right you can't get the beauty of tolstoy unless you meet the condition of um learning how to read well likewise um you cannot meet the you cannot meet the condition of benefiting from the dialectic between reading and writing, unless you meet the condition of facing your own ego and being willing to have your pride destroyed, right? If you don't meet mm -hmm. that condition, mm -hmm. you're not gonna participate in that um, dialectic. And if you don't meet the condition of um, being willing to do that over and over again, you're not going to improve. Um, mm -hmm. So the first thing to keep in mind is that um, the experiences of beauty teach you to live your life aware of conditionality. 
that it's not merely subjectivity and objectivity, like what you think and what, you know, the objective world out there, mm -hmm. that's merely not enough. There's also the, the, also there's the cultivating of your entire person to be able to meet certain conditions that you must be able to meet in order to sublimate or improve as, as we have so described. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you go into a conversation and you don't meet the condition of understanding that you need to meet your metric to, you need to make your metric um, determining the truth as opposed to being right, then there is no possibility for the, uh, the Nash equilibrium situation to be avoided. Likewise, if you don't meet the condition of understanding that you need a balance between freedom or givens in order to avoid totalitarianism, then it is very likely that you're either going to favor far too much freedom, assume that all givens are oppressive, and therefore create an existential nightmare that makes totalitarianism a priest, uh, um, appealing, following like a grand inquisitor in Dostoevsky, or you'll be someone who just assumes that givens are always good um, and therefore contribute to the banality of evil that Hannah Arden described, where it's just given that we are racist xenophobes. You know, you don't even think about it as evil. You just do it. And so you then create a social order that creates, um, that participates in evil. Um, aesthetic epistemology, by moving beyond the dichotomy of subjective, um, of subjective and objectivity, trains you to think in terms of conditionality, which then trains you to think in terms of phenomenology and experience, which then trains yourself to meet and rise to the occasion of that conditionality and phenomenology so that you can meet the condition of participating in these um, dialectics that we have so described, therefore sublimating and improving based on the, move, on the motions between them, um, that if you do not, you will end up pathological. Uh, you will end up neurotic. Um, and so it's also, if we're gonna put it back in the terms of the meaning crisis, the aesthetic epistemology is to suggest that a solution to the meaning, a new solution to the meaning crisis, because because it would be a different argument, it would be a longer argument. A lot of the previous solutions to the meaning crisis fell within objective subjective dichotomies or simple binaries, you know, black versus white, good versus bad, Nazi versus ally, you know, whatever. You, it's all like very simplistic. It's not conditional. Right. Yeah. The new solutions to the meaning crisis are going to have, be conditional. They're going to be matters of conditionality, which if we're not even aware of that, then we're going to keep looking in simple binaries. We're going to keep looking in um, simple either or thinking. And mm -hmm. of course, we're not going to find solution. And then we're, you know, we're not going to advance. Uh, we're not going to uh, find these new methods for meaning, these new answers to the quote unquote problem of meaning. So conditionality becomes the understanding um, aesthetic conditionality um, transforms your thinking. And here's the thing. If indeed intellectual, psychological, spiritual, so on advancement is um, relative to meeting conditions, then, then you also have to act. It's not merely thinking. There are things you have to do to, mm -hmm. um, to, to meet those conditions. Like for example, um, if I say to you, well, you have to, um, in order to uh, advance in the way that we are describing, uh, you have to face your ego. What I just said to you is an idea. You have not faced your ego simply because you've assented to the premise that you need to face your ego. <laughs> you then have to do things that emotionally and psychologically um, hurt and are difficult mm -hmm. to do. So conditionality necessitates thinking in terms of action, uh, phenomenology and doing, whereas thinking simply in terms of subjectivity and objectivity, well, that's all thinking. You don't have to do anything. You just have to like, you know, be dispassionate or whatever they talk about in the court of law. Well, that's all in the head. That's all Cartesian, if you will. So mm -hmm. conditionality is also going to bring things to the realm of action. Yeah, I think I've seen the connection a lot more here. I'm getting the sense that. I'm curious how this lands. I'm getting the sense that there's some sort of beauty found in the dialectic, right? Yes. Even in conversations, for some reason, I, I guess I was missing that point, like in conversations themselves, right? In, in, in this dialectic between two people, uh, there's this condition of like, of, of beauty. There's like, all right, there, there's some higher order thing that is not, that is not less real, but, but, but it is not reduced down to either me or you. And, and if we both meet the condition of understanding that you know there is this thing that that is not reduced to either me or you then we're not going to assume that i that 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 you know my position is right or your position is right because there's something that both of us are right but not fully right and so we're gonna well, what is that what is that thing in the middle in the dialectical relationship and yeah you know it's, it's fascinating I, I, I the connections that are, that are forming here in terms of uh the 
you know, just the right, wrong, black and white and how, how that kind of relates. Like, you know, a, a lot of the, what we see in the world is like, yeah, every, everything's not black and white. Everything's more complex, more nuanced right. than that. And, and I, I never noticed before the connection between, you know, simple minded black and white thinking with, all right, working with dialectics and working with conditionality as, as a way to kind of, you know, do the difficult work of, of, of escaping this black and white. And something that keeps, something that keeps coming up is uh, this concept of infinite and finite games Yes, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it, where especially in terms of the game theoretics of conversation, it, it's coming up as you're talking of like, all right, it, it's a very it's a very finite game to approach a conversation as I just want to win and gain power. Right. Yes. And you, yes. You, you kind of brought up this example of like, all right, if there's a bunch of people sitting in a circle that are all friends, if they all have the incentive to just be right, they may not be friends after that conversation. <laughs> right. <That's> right. <laughs> Whereas if they're, if they understand the conditionality of this, you know, higher order thing where there's, there's potential partial truth in every single perspective. And then, then there's this higher order thing that, that they're trying to reach toward. I keep thinking of like the elephant and yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. where they're all touching. That's different, different parts, parts and so on. Yeah. 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 And so it's like, it, it feels connected to this infinite finite games thing where it's like, all right, that's kind of an infinite game to, to see that there's something higher order that you're trying to get at is like, all right let's maintain friendship, you know, let, let's not try to just destroy each other because that's the dominant thing that, you know, will, yeah, the game theoretic thing to do, actually the, 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 the finite game thing to do. And it feels like somehow the game theoretics is very linked to finite games in terms of like to win in a game theoretic game is to, is to just do a, fi- engage in a finite game and not remember this sort of infinite game of actually keeping the whole yes. thing running in the first place. Magnificent. I mean, with Carla, you know, so for example, if your metric is a finite game, that transforms how the game is played. If your metric is an infinite game, where you define it as an infinite game, that changes how things. So absolutely, yeah, exactly. it's connected on how um, it affects it. You know, a few things. One, you were talking about the beauty of a conversation. When you have a really good conversation with someone, it is in fact like a dance. It is kind of beautiful. It is transcendent of itself. Right. Um, but in order to do that, that only happens when the people who come into the, con- into the conversation meet the conditions of not trying to stroke their ego or that they're looking for something bigger than right. themselves. I mean, when people get like, when you encounter people who are like really into the conversation, they're, they, they're not paying attention to how they look. They're not paying attention to their cell phone. They're in it. And there's something beautiful because there's something beautiful about immersion as such. You know, when you're really lost in it or when you see it, like when you see a, a pianist who's like truly lost in the music. You know, I, I've seen performances where the guy's playing chopping and he's just playing chopping, right? He's like, yeah, just get through it. But then someone who's like, really, you know, playing chopping, you know, Chopin, I'm not even saying it right. Uh, but uh, <laughs> they're lost in it. There's kind of a lostness to it. That lostness of the individual is the appearance of the emergence of the, of the we. You know, the loss of the individual, whenever the individual is quote unquote moved aside, that's when the we appears. And the we, are, the we has a beauty and magic to it. Now, what's critical is the we is made up of eyes. It's not a, you know, I said removal of the eye, but it's where the, we could say this, it's where the, the we emerges when the ego is pushed aside and the we is the only place where the eye really knows itself. Mm. You know, because A equal, you know, it's the AB dialectic Hegel thing, right? So the ego has to move away for the I to emerge with the we, because the I is only ever known in the we, and the we is only never, ever known in the I. And the, it's in that moment that there's a beauty. That I, we moment is evidence, is indeed the solution to the game theory, um, the problem, the conversation that we're describing, the Nash equilibrium. That is when the Nash equilibrium of conversation is not occurring, right. is in fact being overcome, and you're getting a truly optimal result, as opposed to a suboptimal result, that result that is, that is a consequence of being, people having the wrong metrics. Um, so, the, I mean, the other thing too, like on the idea, so there, there's this kind of this higher order thing that, again, Everything I just described about being lost in a conversation, I promise you most people hearing this know what we're describing. And yet it's kind of vague, right? It's kind of vague. It's not kind of fluffy or different things, but it's not fluffy when you experience it. It's only fluffy in conversation because language is linear and what we are describing is emergent. So language is always going to sound fluffy when it is trying to describe something that's emergent because language is not freaking emergent in its structure. It's linear in its structure. So in order to get what we are describing, you have to remember it's you have to remember and think back on a memory 
more so than pay attention to the words. Mm -hmm. That's something that messes people up when you start talking about high order, spirituality, emerging, because they're thinking of the words versus the experiences that the words point to, where the proof is found in the experience because experiences can be emergent and dynamic, whereas language can only be linear by its nature, by what it is. Um, I can never ever use a word that describes every item in this room at the same time in a manner that does not imply sequence, that doesn't, like if I look at you and say, there is a desk and a bookcase and pictures in this room, does that not create the impression that the desk is more important than the bookcase or that the bookcase is more important than the pictures? Because I said in a certain order, right? Mm -hmm. um, is, it not the, is it not the case though that in my experience when I'm looking at both that bookcase and those pictures, there's no and, I see them together in the same image of the bookcase and the pictures. I literally cannot describe to you this room. I cannot describe to you the experience at all without creating a sense of hierarchy, without except, like separation, division, all these things that are not there because of the mm -hmm. nature of language itself. So language is always... You, you really get messed up like in solving these game theory problems on aesthetic epistemology when you are paying too much attention to the words per se. That's also something the poets can teach you, right? The poets know that as well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they like the word. And yet what's so funny is precisely when there is this vision that they were pointing to, there's an expertise in language that develops as well. It's like the C.S. Lewis, you put first things first, you get second things as well. Uh, when you're always aware that you're trying to point to something more than the language, then you also are even aware of the need to try to improve language. And so you do this effort to make it better precisely because mm. you accept mm. the failure, right? Um, so all of that emergence that we are describing, if, you, if that's your metric, you know, if your goal becomes that metric, well, then the dominant strategies, like the strategy, the winning strategies are no longer the dominant strategy. Um, everything becomes about invitation. <laughs> everything becomes about inclusion and relationship and bringing in and pointing to something more. You know, another reason why um, ultimately it has to be beyond the group is it's not so, you know, that can sound transcendent. And again, that can sound mushy. Um, and so it's not so hard. Um, I could literally not describe, I'll use this room as an example. I could not describe to you every detail of this room. I couldn't, I couldn't, I really couldn't. Like whatever I say to you is gonna be like 0.001% of everything going on in this room. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're having a conversation about, oh, truth, beauty and goodness, of course there's gonna be like way more beyond what we are describing that it can right. only point to, that we can only know by escaping our own contracts. Cause I can't even describe a room to you, let alone the correct <laughs> socioeconomic order. Um, you know, this is not like, like that's, like, again, sometimes people hear it's like, oh, it sounds kind of spiritual and different things. No, just really pay attention to the fact that you can't even describe a room and the fact that, you know, the outcome should be a murder. The chances of someone, the chances of someone in a conversation knowing everything that needs to be known about foreign policy and therefore warranting the strategy of being right is like nil. Mm -hmm. Like the chances of having the world expert on say Christianity or the way you should live your life right there, who knows everything is basically zero. Uh, maybe, and even if they did, even like, I think I read this once, like if you were to spend every single day, like reading books nonstop, like mm -hmm. for 80 years, I think you can get through less than 2% of all the books on planet earth, right? You can't even get close, not even close. Now, of course, Luckily, we don't have to worry about reading all the books because a lot of books are bad. But even out of the good books, like there's always so much more to know. So even though like as we're talking about something greater than the conversation, something emergent, you know, if anyone listening to this can think that that's purely a kind of spiritual notion. No, that's based on the facticity of finitude as well. Like the very fact facticity of finitude is pointing to in its very finitude, a kind of infinity that at best, well, one, the chances of you in your autonomy getting at it is like, none um but maybe in a network of other people where you can have a network effect and therefore a multiplier effect and therefore emerging you might be able to point towards something beyond yourself um is is much greater and then if you can link that up to the social level you know things can change but none of this and then i'll pass it back to you none of this though can occur if you have the wrong game if you have the wrong metric you know none of this can occur if in conversations the goal is being right as opposed to determining what is the case mm -hmm. versus determining what is true um none of that is going to occur and beauty, searching for experiences of beauty is to, is to train yourself to search for situations of emergence, uh, which are of a higher likelihood to be following the right metric uh, of, and to be escaping Nash equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So then beauty, as we have so described, it becomes a useful heuristic to determine how to um, focus, 
how to um, use your time, to time management, to know what to look for. What is the sign that what is occurring here is escaping uh, Nash equilibriums or, or dominant strategies or whatever. And beauty becomes an important sign that you're participating in something that's more emergent as opposed to not participating in a dialectic and therefore more probable to become pathological. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I was, I was getting this dialectic coming up as well around direct experience in language like you kept speaking about how language will never get at the thing and yes. then what, what kept coming up what felt important was that doesn't mean that language is not important or that we don't need yes. to use language right that's right because it's like I, I think we spoke in our last conversation about this uh all creativity will is finite and will never get at the infinite thing yes. that is trying to express yes. yet yet the creative process is, is and i think this is where we brought in conditionality is like the 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 condition of 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 creativity, the condition of like a writer meeting a certain standard of being able to express something, right? Or there's there's the continual like process of mastering the craft, which is very fulfilling in that you're in that you're continuing. I think we said it as failing better, right? You're yes. continuing to fail better at expressing the infinite thing that you can never fully express through the creative act, yes. and which feels like why language is important and yes. why. Um, I'm I, like part of me is like tr struggling with why is conversation and dialectic important if you can never actually get at the the, the ultimate higher order thing you know even with uh, you'll yes. get two percent of books or you'll get the entire global population let let's say that we get the grand vision of every single human on the planet is is meets the condition of a sort of we space right uh, there's right. still going to be more beyond that right it's still going to be infinite in, in terms of even every single human on the planet coming into some sort of coherence will still not hit the mark of whatever the the direct experience uh, right. the, the the infiniteness of whatever it is we're trying to understand and truth and all of this stuff and yeah there, there was something else coming up around yeah so there was the dialectic between dang i lost it <laughs> no, well, I, I talked about that for 20 minutes, so, you know, no. um, without language, you can't even not not get it. Uh, you know, like language is never fully capturing the thing, but if you didn't have language, you couldn't even not not capture the thing. It would actually be significantly worse. Um, language is also necessary to talk with other people. I cannot take the experiences in my head and plop them in your head magically. Mm -hmm. I have to speak with you. So speaking is the only possibility to get the I we because there cannot even be a meaningful we. You 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 cannot right. um you know the other. There's a funny sense, and um, hear me out. What I mean by that if like animals, for example, don't really function as others for human beings because they're almost too different. I'm not saying they're not wonderful. We have pets and different things, but to actually, animals don't really make you reflect on your ego, right? They don't like affect your statics, anxiety, or different things like that because they're in a sense too different, right? They're too mm -hmm. other, like they're other, other, right? In order to have an other of which can cause the dialectical process, there has to be enough similarity to where the difference is meaningful because you really feel it. And that's where human beings can function as others because they're not so different that there's no seeing of yourself in them or reflecting back on what they think about you or concealment of their consciousness. But they're also not so similar that they can simply function in service of your ego. So they have to find this nice little sweet spot between similarity and difference in order to be a other in the sense of what Satra and Hegel and Heidegger and all these people are describing. Well, so we need, we need the other, but if there's the other and you can't well, if you could take your mind and put in a, another person's mind, they wouldn't be another. They'd be the same. They'd be you. And so they couldn't have the dialectical function. They could just contribute to sameness, which mm. then would be death, would be a death drive. Because here's the funny thing. In reality, if two things are identically the same, they don't exist. Uh, there, there's no such thing as sameness, kind of delusion. You know, there's no such thing as sameness in reality, like true sameness. There's similarity, but not sameness. So mm. if you could take your mind and put in another person's mind, there wouldn't be two people. There'd be one person in all practical purposes. So you could not have a dialectic there. All right, well then, crap, where does, that, where does that leave us? Well, therefore, in order for there to meaningfully be another, an other and a meaningful dialectic, then we have to, by definition, be using an imperfect mm -hmm. medium. Because, an imper because a perfect medium would mean there could be no dialectic. There'd be an equal sign. Uh, an equal sign is not a dialectic. So if there's gonna be a dialectic, by definition, the medium of exchange has to be imperfect. Of which then, funny enough, the very imperfection of the medium functions as reason not to try. <laughs> and yet if the medium was perfect there would be nothing to try 
because you would be equal. Um, so the key, one of the, the, the tricks to aesthetic epistemology is to, the very imperfection of the medium is kind of a Schrodinger's cat thing, which either alive or dead. That's either evidence that you should try to speak with others or evidence that you shouldn't try to speak with others. You decide, you decide the meaning of that imperfection. Mm -hmm. And the temptation in binary thinking is to say, well, don't try. And you sure as heck ain't gonna try if it's all about your ego. Why would you try to speak people when you know it's ultimately gonna be imperfect? All that can do is hurt your ego because you're gonna encounter failure. So if you're following the wrong metric, dominant strategies, you sure as heck aren't going to take seriously conversation. It's going to be all you're ever going to do is small talk. It's not by trans that you have a culture of endless small talk and chatter, as Heidegger talked about. That's only logical mm -hmm. if, um, if that's the game theory, if that's the metric. That, that, is, the, that is the Nash equilibrium chatter. Chatter is the, um, is the Nash equilibrium result that we should expect in a society that has the wrong metric. Um, because there's no reason to talk talking and certainly not reason to seriously talk because all the imperfect medium can do is risk your rightness mm -hmm. when you inevitably use it wrong. You understand yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But if you instead change your metric and make it about being right, well, determining what is right, forgive me. Um, well, the imperfect medium is all you got and you got to use it because the goal is to determine what's right and whatever tool you got is the one you got to use or you, or you fail. And so then you learn to live with that imperfection and to figure out how to fail better and to improve because the only other alternative is to not try, which following the metric of determining truth means you're not determining truth and therefore you're failing. Um, so the imperfection of less language is necessary to even make possible the endeavor. And then if you change your metric, you have the motivation to use that imperfect tool to do the best you can because not all failure is equal. You know, getting a 52 on the test is not the same as getting a 98. Neither one of you got 100%, but the 98 is better than the 50 freaking two. Yeah, um, yeah. Just because language always fails does not mean the writings of Tolstoy are the same as me scribbling out a freaking shopping list when I'm going to Sam's Club. I promise <laughs> you that Tolstoy uses language better than when I'm trying to remember not to forget the carrots and apples. Yeah. I promise you. Um, so the other thing that's very important, and then I'll pass it back to you, is if we take seriously that the human being is optimal in the dialectic and the sublimation, sublimation is a Hegel term, that means kind of advancement or so on and so forth in the imperfection. Mm -hmm. If we take seriously that that is the only option because the alternative of being perfect means there is no difference. And if there's no difference, there's sameness, which means there's nothing. There's nothing because reality is composed of similarity and difference, not pure difference and not sameness. Well, then the fact that things are the way that they are is the very thing that makes possible being and becoming at all. And the only alternative is, not, is effacement, to not even exist. So then you start seeing the shortcomings that we are describing as the necessary conditionality. It's all about conditionality. It becomes the necessary conditionality for anything to happen at all. And then simply the question becomes after that, once you realize that, once you realize that conditionality is the necessary state of being, the question becomes the following. What are you going to do about it? Right. What conditions am, am I going to meet? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, so it came back to me what I was trying, what I was. What, Delightful. What, and uh, it, it does feel very resonant with everything you just said as well, which is uh, to, to pre-frame it a little bit. There was a conversation yesterday on uh, the STOA with, Cadell. Raven, yeah, they on the this. dark renaissance. Yeah, yeah, on the dark renaissance. I got home from work. I had, had a crazy day at work and I had that tweet with Raven and Bard and all those fun people. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Owen, that was delightful. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. And uh, I got the sense of, are they, they were speaking on, it felt like a dialectic between the yes. dark renaissance and game in the game B game space, B. Which, yep. which seems like a lot, a, a different, a kind of the same topic described in a different way of what we're yes. kind of discussing here yes. of win-win dynamics, win-lose dynamics, competition, and all of these things, other self and other, uh, like why um, I was getting the sense of, so they were critiquing this, the, the game B yep. film and, and a lot of their critiques were centering around um, competition is necessary. If we lived in this completely, uh, game B world that that is yep. kind of imagined in this film, then there would be no competition. There would be no, you know, conflict. There would be no sort of headbutting between individuals. 
Now, as I was getting this, I was, uh, the, some, someone said something around, I don't understand game B because without conflict, nothing happens or something like that in, in the sense of, yep. But, but, but yeah, as, as you were speaking, I was, I was getting a more kind of nuanced, complex understanding of this is like win-lose versus win-win dynamics in the sense of it, it, it feels like we can have conflict while maintaining win-win dynamics is, is, is what yes. I'm kind of getting as the synthesis between Dark Renaissance's game and Game B in that, you know, game theorics, theoretics, win-lose dynamics, you know, just kind yep. of just trying to be... Um, powerful and just win over and just like just like forcefully overpower anyone's perspective in an egoic way feels like what game b is kind of pointing to in the sense of like mm. yeah like it's bad if we just like focus on power and nothing else and we just focus on ego games and nothing else right uh, where, whereas they were kind of crit critiquing if we're just in this state of harmony all the time you know and and when then nothing happens because there, why would you do anything if we're kind of in this, in this state of harmony? And so uh, I, I would love to, to kind of hear, hear, hear your, how, how you understand this dialectic in terms of we can have these win-win dynamics, you know, if, if we're all in a conversation, we can have this kind of infinite game. Uh, what we're trying to do is beyond just any one of us, Whereas conflict and competition are still present, even though we're all aware of the sort of infinite game win-win situation that we're participating in. Well, I love those people. We had uh, Raven and Goodell was part of the family symposium Michelle and yeah. I did with Daboot and Javier, which we had a lot of fun on in Bard. And, uh, you know, I just, um, it, the, the section, especially in Bard's on Global Empire, where it talks about the difference between mobilism and internalism, I think is quite, quite good uh, that I took a bunch of notes on. And uh, Owen, I had, a, I love Owen. We had that great talk at Techno Social with Mr. Frega, and he's going to put out a book soon on ontological design, which I, I think is going to be magnificent. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but anyway, everything you're describing, um, well, you know, so let's go back to that discussion of the um the conversation right and you have this where suddenly it becomes not about being right but it becomes about determining what is right there's actually still a competition there you know what the competition's against it's about your ignorant you're not knowing it's about you're competing as a group now as a team against the ignorance per se the darkness and you're trying to take some away and to learn so the the competition goes from being horizontal to being vertical right but you see the other key though is the reason this emergence is so difficult is because in fact, the ego, though it moves aside, we describe the ego moving aside and the, e the I emerging with the we kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Great. The, the issue is the ego is still there and it can still roar back at any moment. And all that has to happen is someone in the conversation make a little comment or do one little thing and boom, the ego's back, <laughs> right? So the ego is always there. You never get rid of it. The thing that um, like a bard and they wanna stress you never, ever get rid of the ego. You know, the, a way to, um, a term that Barbie used, hard, um, Bard, and you probably heard it, they, they talk about um, uh, mythos, logos, and pathos are terms, right, yeah. uh, which, um, you know, logos you can ascribe, and Mr. Bard may see this recording and be like, that idiot's getting all wrong. I'm sorry, Mr. Bard, I'm trying. Uh, you know, the logos you can associate with the rational mind you know, the enlightenment, trying to understand the world, world in terms of reason. The mythos you can understand in kind of the, the narrative, the story, the Jungian, you know, kind of story that we're trying to organize ourselves with. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, the pathos is you can associate with the emotional, psychological side, the psychoanalytical, you can even say the dark side, the shadow. It's not all bad, but it has to do a lot with the human psyche and how that there's an inherent un instability to the pathos, if you will. Really? Um, and you know, those are all artistic terms and they're much more complex than that. That's just a generality that I will use and will suggest to everyone to read Mr. Bard's books. Um, but the point that they were trying to make is you can never get rid of pathos, all right? And pathos is always there. And so the notion of a harmony would only mean anything at all if it took seriously human pathos. Because a lot of times when you, you know, I read a number of Mr. Rutt's papers, Daniel's like, um, you know, where he had a talk with Mr. Weinstein, Weinstein or different things, all part of the, you know, um, of the uh, Game D Association. And, you know, so for example, um, Mr. Weinstein, I think Raven, the wonderful Raven, I think brought this up, um, where they were talking about, um, you know, the moment you have um, mating, you know, you have sex or you're going to have competition, right? Because people mm -hmm. want to get that woman instead of the other woman. And um, Mr. Slime, I can't pronounce his name yet. You know, he said something like, well, I thought about that. And, you know, basically what we have to do is learn to be more polyamorous, right? Where we have to um, learn not to have sexual uh, possession of one another. 
That would be an example where you think the solution is getting rid of pathos, where you think that we can train ourselves to get rid of pathos, that we can kind of evolve to a higher place where pathos is not in that way is not going to manifest. Now, Mr. Bard is going to say that you really can't change human nature. All you can do, like technology changes, but human nature is rather constant. Now you can have pockets of people who know better. And certainly you could have a game B where, you know, a uh, hundred people agree to the terms and they live in that community. Um, but the question of course is scale and scale is always the, the issue. Right. Really? Um, you likewise, you can always have Deleuzean individuals, people who can like define themselves in terms of essential difference and so on and so forth. But the problem, of course, becomes can you, in fact, have a um, society that is organized around Deleuzean uh, essential difference? Now, that's an entire different topic. There's no doubt that individuals can do it. There are plenty of individuals online that show that Deleuzean, um, Deleuzean essential difference is fine for their identity in the same way that you have, you do in fact have communities that are exercising something, th something like game B. The question becomes scale, ah, scale. <laughs> that, and which is, you know, there's actually a really important book um, that nobody reads and therefore you know it's important uh, by a man named Leopard Co. He wrote a book called The Breakdown of Nations, which basically argues the following. It doesn't matter what the political ideology is, conservative, liberal, Marxist, whatever, everything works on a certain scale and everything breaks on a certain size, where he talks about everyone thinks about left versus right, they don't think about up versus down. And that's really messed us up because you have to understand that game A, as they call it, um, came into existence in response to the problem of scale. You know, hunter and gatherers, like there's this idea that you read in, um, you know, uh, Jared Diamond or Quinn, who wrote Ismael a long time ago, this idea that the biggest mistake was in human history was uh, leaving hunter gathering, right? And becoming, you know, kind of agriculture and different things. Mm. Um, you know, if hunting and gathering was so great, I, I think we'd probably still be hunting, hunting and gathering. <laughs> there was probably a very good reason the society switched to an agricultural, mm. and there can be a Rousseau and Eden. That was the point Cadell, you know, Cadell brought that up. He said civilization came into existence for a good freaking reason. It's not that one day some like people got together and said, yeah, let's just, I don't know, let's just plant some things. Uh, no, they, <laughs> they, they, they went, no, we need to do this. Um, and, and the other key point to that is anyone right now Anyone right now on this planet, if they really wanted to, could start a hunting and gathering lifestyle. Anyone could. You, me, we could do it. Why is it that so few people do it? <laughs> because people like this sucks and we don't want to do it. And so it's important to keep that in mind. You can say, well, it's not so simple because you have to for, you know, participate in society and different things like that. Not really. I mean, yes, no. I mean, you can, you'd be amazed at how self-sustaining you can become and very rarely go into town if you really, really um, didn't want to. So the very fact that people today don't tend to jump in and become hunter-gatherers when they easily could, if they wanted to, would be evidence that there's very good reason that people um, did what they wanted to do. So the issue is what game A, um, when you frame game A, and Cadell actually today had a magnificent um, substack that he released that elaborated on some of the points. Um, mm. When you have a game A that says game A was, you know, um, before game A, the non-game, I think they call it in the video, you know, that was good. You know, there was harmony with nature and different things. And then game A came, screwed it all up. And we need to get to game B, which keeps the good of game A, but moves into game B. Um, you have to take very seriously that game A arose by trying to figure out a very particular problem, how do you direct pathos, the negative of the human, in a sense, trick it to, to solve the problem of the fact that people don't have toilets? How do you trick pathos to provide heating? How do you trick pathos to um, distribute limited resources? This is an incredibly difficult problem. Mm -hmm. And no system that can answer the question of how to direct pathos toward a constructive end will survive. And generally what came into existence was something called the pricing mechanism, uh, which Friedrich Hayek, Thomas Sowell, all these people talk about. We think of the pricing mechanism as primarily in the business of profit. The, the pricing mechanism is actually primarily in the business of solving the problem of limited information and limited resources and coordinating over a very complex supply chain, how to get all these re resources to different places at different times. Mm. And it also figured out a way that you can like feel fulfilled as a human being as you run a company 
that provides bronze wires to houses, like this very simple task where you could get an identity and you could take care of your family as you did this thing that the society needs in order for children not to die in childbirth because you need the hospitals to have heating and you need to have mm -hmm. the refrigerators have food and so on and so forth. And there's that late Lepo read where he talks about how nobody knows how to make a pencil and the pencil comes into existence because of this incredibly complex supply chain that no single consciousness can come into existence. And please note that therefore the price mechanism is radically dialectical and involves a combination of the I and the we because a bunch of people are working together who don't even know each other, who are across ideological differences and somehow cooperate. Hmm. Here's the thing, at the center of game A is a radically extraordinarily mechanism of cooperation called the pricing mechanism that is transcendent of any individual that cannot be reduced to an individual that somehow makes it to where I can go to freaking Lowe's and get a wrench when I need it. It's unbelievable. The, the solution of the pricing mechanism. One of the problems is we now talk about capitalism. We don't talk about the pricing mechanism. Oh, I, I have plenty of critiques of capitalism. I have that, you know, I said it, you know, the piece on the invincibility of the corporation, the trade off of wages for hours, the capture of intellectual property rights, so on and so forth, intrinsic motivation, and all these different things. I had a great talk with Johannes. But when one critiques capitalism, a critique of capitalism, and let's say you prove capitalism is a mess, which I think you could easily do, um, that does not mean you have a solution to the pricing mechanism. You do not have a method to replace the pricing mechanism with. But here's the thing. If the pricing mechanism exists, there is going to be some form of competition, because the pricing mechanism also requires for there to be many makers of bottled water, mm. many makers of, of bronze, and there also has to be a, main, a means to reward people in the pricing mechanism so that they care to do it. And what is that called? Money. And money also has to have worth and not be paper. And that means it gives you access to things that the pricing mechanism and supply chain provides that otherwise you cannot get. Mm. But the moment mm. you do all this, then the potential for what exists, game A, and the competition and the toxic dynamics and different things. The great trick is to figure out how to have a pricing mechanism that maintains harmony uh, as opposed to turn into the, well, basically Japan. Honestly, I had a talk with Daniel Zaruba on where Japan sort of represents where all this leads us to uh, in mental health and psychological. It's like the, you know, they're talking a lot about metamodernity. Japan is the quintessential example, example of metamodernity. That's an entirely different discussion. The Daniel Zaruba thing, we talk about this and we also get into, um, you know, Studio Ghibli. So it's really worth your time. Uh, so, you know, my neighbor Toto to, to, and all these different things. Um, and, uh, and Akira and Ghost in the Shell. So anyway, um, but um, if you get rid of the pricing mechanism, um, and you don't have anything to replace it with. Um, it is very, very doubtful that game B will function um, and that it will not lead to a problem. Basically, the solution as a, um, is to see what you need, and this is all um, large that I'm pointing to. You, you need a society. In order to change the social order, it doesn't happen on the systems level. It has to happen on the individual level. Um, another way to, to, to phrase this is since the map is never the territory, since you're always going to have a girdle, curt girdle incompleteness, every single system will have a hole in it. It will not be able to address everything, whether it be capitalism, Marxism, socialism, what every single one of them is going to have an essential incompleteness. But to, at the, precisely at the point where the map does not equal the territory, precisely at the point where you cannot fully systematize human pathology. Okay, right there. And do you know who stands at that little hole, that, um, that girdle, girdle point, I wanna call it or whatever? The human being. The human being then chooses if that opening in the map matches more so the territory or aligns enough with the territory based on their choices, based on their actions, based on what mm -hmm. they do. So it all comes down to the human mind and the pathology and how they interact, which if they have the wrong metrics for their game theory, if they're following a binary epistemology as opposed to an aesthetic epistemology, and if they think the goal is to be right as opposed to determine what is right, then at that point of incompleteness between the map of the territory, the system matching up with the society, that will precisely be the point where the system falls apart, where it fails to work. Mm. But if instead the average person understands the, the need of absolute knowing becomes an absolute knower in the Hegelian term, which basically means A, B. Um, then, although the map doesn't equal the territory, the human being precisely in their positioning and in their thinking will be able to fill the gap, never erase the lack, they never erase the lack, but they can move between the map and the territory 
in the lack, integrated with the lack. And that's the whole philosophy of lack series I've done with Cadell and Ebert and, 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 and Tim. Mm -hmm. um, they can integrate with the lack to move between them, knowing that they can never make the map equal the territory. And if they do, A will equal A. And what do we say? If you have an equal sign in language, then you have a facement and everything is lost. So if you make the map equal the territory, everything is lost. If you try from a position of game B to act like human beings are capable in their nature of that harmony, that you can get rid of pathology as opposed to learn to live with it, then you're going to create a terror. And that's what they were all saying. If that's what they were all saying in that talk. If mm -hmm. you ignore human pathology, you become, you know, Bard was basically saying Maoist China. You become totalitarian. That's exactly right. Because you force the territory to be the map. You force the world to be the ideology. And of course, since the world is way bigger than the ideology, it must be squeezed into the ideology, which is violence, which is totalitarianism. So instead, what has to do the only, every single system, capitalism, socialism, you name it, it doesn't matter. Every single system eventually becomes neurotic and pathological if the individual on the individual level does not become a dialectical thinker. Every mm -hmm. single one of them. There is no perfect map. There is no perfect system. Cap capitalism has now become corporate. The pricing mechanism became corporatism, which I would also describe as a bankocracy, financial, all these different things. It's a whole different topic. But yes, capitalism today has, um, just like Ledwood Coe said, gotten so big and it's become a problem. And it's actually operated according to a logic of mutually assured destruction using the debt markets and the derivative markets and so on. And so in the, mainly the bond market. Um, but the pricing mechanism was a miracle. But since the human beings using the price, pricing mechanism did not develop dialectical thinking, the price mechanism gave rise to the AA thinking of the corporatism, which has mm -hmm. now become, to use Mr. Ebert's language, cancerous. It's become a, because it, it's, got, it's driven by a death trap, it's become a problem. Every single ideology becomes pathological and quote unquote cancerous if the members of that system, community, what have you, are not absolute knowers or AB dialectical thinkers. Mm -hmm. Um, which requires then all of the changes in your, your uh, metrics of conversation, game theory, epistemology, all those things have to go together. If that does not occur, it doesn't matter what system you use. And the end of the day, the human temptation to create an AA versus an AB, the temptation to create an equal sign, which would be an effacement versus a dialectic and emotion where we can be moved towards something true will prevail. Um, and the pathology that you, the pathos that you have ignored and tried to pretend like is not there, and this is what they were all saying, will eventually win. And, and before passing it back to you, um, any system that does not take seriously path, the pathos mm -hmm. must then make its opponent human nature. It must fight human nature. And any system that fights human nature loses. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, I loved what you said about any society where the individuals aren't in a dialectical process and don't know, understand dialectical thinking or don't do it will fall apart. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, and again, like, the, you know, the ideas in game B of emphasizing non-zero sum. That's absolutely the truth. The miracle right. of the pricing mechanism in capitalism is fantastic mm -hmm. um the idea that healthcare in america is crazy because it follows an insurance model in a network which would be a critique of the system that's true that, so everything it's not you don't have one that's completely false but you but but what is dialectical thinking it's the empathy you're moving between it's a kind of empathy from the socialist position you empathize with capitalism from the marxist position you empathize with mm -hmm. um keynesianism and keynesianism with and you have to it goes back where you become instead of just being critical of marxism critical of capitalism <laughs> you become a critical thinker sure. where you enter into it and you look around and you say you know what this pricing mechanism is kind of unbelievable even as a marxist you go oh. This is really solving a massive problem that Marxism doesn't have a solution to. If you don't do that, you and you're a hardcore Marxist, Marxism's going to fail because you're not going to know what mechanism you need to replace it with, or you're not going to think about that, right? So you're just going to force the world to fit your map, fit your ideology, and then it will be effaced. It will be it will be destroyed. Uh, the center will not hold things fall apart. Crimson tide on the ocean, you know, et cetera. The falcon will not hear the falcon. Um, so uh, it, it, you have to have, in, in the way we were talking about empathy in terms of people, there's also something to be said about empathy in terms of 
modes of thought, ideology, worldview, philosophies. In the same way that you want to have the ability to really enter into Sarah's world, you really want to have the ability to enter into the world of capitalism, enter into the world of Marxism, of pragmatism, of Heidegger, and to think about the world that they did. Because if you do not, then you are not being dialectical in your philosophical thinking, and you are probably contributing to the wrong game theory dynamics. Mm. Amazing. Uh, just a little note. I've got a hard stop in about eight minutes. Oh, you know, I thought we were going to talk till like five in the afternoon, man. Yeah, I, I think, you know, because <laughs> no, I enjoy speaking. Please don't let me make you lose your job. <laughs> that is not my goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, I want to end it off with something. I, if you want to just use this as an opportunity to wrap up. Um, Please. I'm fat. I'm fascinated with with the amount of different sources that you're bringing into these conversations. And, and I'm fascinated in particular with like kind of one, one question that I've been uh, sitting with for a long time has been, how do I choose what to consume, uh-huh. right? How do I choose what to consume in, or in how do I know what is worth consuming and what is not mm-hmm. given the, the infinite amount of seemingly infinite sure. amount of different books and, uh, pieces of content to consume and I'm just fascinated if you want to riff on riff on a little bit um, this kind of motivation this fascination and drive with uh, aesthetic epistemology as it relates to reading books and intellect and you know it, it's a tremendous question and I appreciate your kind um kind words uh one of the things I always like to do so one if everyone you know it, it doesn't hurt if everyone's saying Don Quixote is one of the greatest novels ever written that's probably a good bet because all you can ever do is make bets, right? You don't know if the book you're about to read is in fact going to be amazing, but there's a pretty good bet if Harold Bloom is like Don Quixote is the greatest novel ever written. You probably should read it. You probably should. Uh, even if you don't fully understand. The other thing when you read a book, let it let it wash over you. Don't spend the whole time trying to grab every single sentence. Like, because if you do, your ego is getting in the way the entire time. Let it wash over you. Uh, is another important thing. Mm-hmm. The other thing to do is if you're reading Keynes general theory and he's mentioning, you know, Alfred Marshall, he's talking about, you know, these different people. Note the people that the great minds are reading and thinking about. That's probably a really good guy, right? So if Keynes is hanging out with Virginia Woolf and he's hanging out um, and he's talking, you know, with Bertrand Russell or whatever, that's probably a good guy that all those people have something of value to say because people tend to be attracted to other people that kind of advance them in their work, right? So pay attention to the references that people make in books that you read, like that you find interesting. The other thing that I would highly suggest, just my view, is um, after you finish a book, so a few things. One, after you finish a book, go back through and any of the lines you underlined type them out on your computer, you know, do that so you can reference it and see them because there's something about writing, even if you never open that document again, the very act of writing helps get it on your head. You know, that was something Benjamin Franklin talked about in the autobiography with the newspapers, they would what I really, really liked. Um, the other thing is I, I think it's kind of valuable that like, if you're reading Keynes, like the economic books, you kind of read together. So you get a sense, you want a sense of the conversation, not simply the thinking of Keynes, but the th- Keynes in conversation with Hike, in Marshall, in like, in Roberto, Marx, and all these different people, like the conversation, that's also quite mm-hmm. good because then you can get a sense of the whole. And then once you get a good grasp of the comment, here's the thing. Once you get a good grasp of the conversation in economics, which is going to involve a lot of the major thinkers and in, in different things, there's nothing wrong mm-hmm. with that. Well, then you can put the conversation of economics in conversation with the conversation of philosophy. So then you go over here and learn what is the conversation of continental philosophy? What are they talking about? And now you have a dialectic between the conversation of economics and the conversation of, say, psychoanalysts or, or people like that. So read. I guess it's important to read, not so much, say, to learn what Keynes thought to learn what Hike thought, but to get a sense of the conversation that mm. they're having. Because that's, you know, for example, a lot of people don't know this. Friedrich, you know, Kane, so a lot of people will read like The Road to Serfdom by Friedrich Hike, and they'll be like, oh, he's an anti-Keynesian and hated Keynes or whatever and so forth and so on. Kane said he loved the book. He wrote Hike and he's like, I agree with basically everything in this book. This is magnificent. There's just, there's just one issue. You're, you're not a pure anarchist. Um, you draw the line that government has a, a role somewhere, Hike. But wait a minute, Hike, if you draw the line at X, well, you're going to have the slippery slope just like I am if I draw it at Q, right? right. So you, you're, you're, so the question, so then you realize, oh, 
The difference between Hike and Keynes is not so much the involvement of government, but the amount of the involvement of government. Mm -hmm. Well, once you realize that, you, you have a sense of what the real debate is, not if there should be government intervention or if right. there shouldn't be government intervention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could spend your whole life thinking that that's the debate. You could spend your whole life thinking that that's the conversation. That's not the real conversation. The real conversation is, where do you draw it? Likewise, like I was saying about scale and size, mm -hmm. if you read all the systems builder or the sociologists or different things, that's, that's basically always been, that's been like the debate. Where do you draw the, Dun you know, they talk about the Dunbar number all that, right? right? Like where, where is the point where society can't grow anymore without falling apart? Mm -hmm. Not if society should be small or if it should be big, <laughs> but the precise point. That's a lot of the conversation. And in literature, a lot of the major conversation is what exactly is irony? Like, what is it about irony that seems to have ontological significance? So I guess, and I, I could, this is a topic I really like, so I'm not going to keep you for 20 minutes, but I would say read for the conversation of mm -hmm. economics, not simply to be, to know what Hayek thought, know what Keynes thought, look right. for the space between the thinkers, because that's where you locate the real debate, where the real thinking is happening. Mm -hmm. That's probably not even solved yet, but between the thinkers and then between the disciplines, that's where you locate the main things that uh, the main topics that require thinking. Mm. Yeah, amazing. That's what I was going to add to as well is like then even even the distinction yes. of different fields versus one another is also just an, uh, another dialectic. It feels like awesome. Yeah, yeah. Read read for what's between the books per se. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining me on the podcast today. This has been a delight. I enjoy these conversations immensely, Mr. Nelson. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.